So, uh, hey everyone, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Shahya Shahrabi. I am a graphic programmer and game developer working in Realities IO, a company specialized in the use of photogrammetry for real time. And over the years, we have worked with a variety of partners such as Facebook, Audi, NASA, pushing the limits of what photogrammetry can do. In my free time, I like to learn about new techniques, new graphic techniques, and I like to share my learnings on my blog. On the screen, you see some of the experiments I have done in the past few years, which you might have seen floating around social media. Today, I would like to talk about maps and shaders, two of my favorite topics. So why talk about shaders at all? Shaders are programs written for the GPU. And if you don't use the GPU, it would be an extra processing unit, which is sitting idle on your computer, not doing anything. And since resources are so limited for real-time applications to begin with, it does make sense to try to master shaders in order to harness the power of GPUs. Besides that, GPUs are not just any processing unit. They are very fast at doing very specific tasks. These are the type of tasks where you take the same set of instructions, so basically the same function, and you apply it to a very large block of data. This happens to be a lot of type of tasks that you need to do in rendering, geometry processing, and many other fields. And again, it makes sense to learn shaders if you wish to do those in real time. Besides that, if you really master shaders, you can always break free from the default implementation your engine of choice has for many things such as lighting. For example, if realistic lighting doesn't match the feel of your game design, you can adjust to do something more cartoony to better match the feel of the game. So why talk about math? Why, why talk about mathematics now? Over the past decade or so, tools used for game development have gotten more and more user-friendly. They are better documented, and they have way-friendlier licenses for people who just want to start off. This has made it so that people from different life experiences and different backgrounds have joined, joined the game industry. And the experiences they bring with them is the reason why our games nowadays sound better, look better, or better acted or directed. At the same time, this kind of created a generation of creative coders, which are very comfortable programming in the engine of choice, Unity or Unreal. However, never got the traditional software engineering background education. I myself was in this situation a few years ago, um, came out of Bachelor of Game Design, which is a Bachelor of Art. And I realized pretty immediately that the number of fields I can contribute to is very limited. I talked to a friend of mine who at the time was a senior software engineer in Facebook, and he gave me the tip to start learning linear algebra. He said linear algebra is the centerpiece of many areas of computer science, such as computer graphics, computer vision, machine learning, compression, and many other fields. I kind of took that advice to heart and spent a year doing one hour a day of linear algebra. And already after a few months, I could see the transformations in me. My knowledge of maths empowered me to do things that I couldn't dream of before and made, made it possible for me to better bring my creative vision and the aesthetics I wanted on the screen. So I suppose in this talk, I'm trying to pass on this good advice to you, which I got, that it does make sense to try to master the mathematics of the field you are in uh, because it makes it possible for you to kind of break free from default implementations and do very innovative things. Every time people talk about shaders, there is a line popping up where someone says shaders are black magic. I find that sentence interesting because people who say that are actually quite competent programmer in their respective engine, C Sharp for Unity, Blueprints for Unreal, and so on and so forth. So why is it that shaders are so inaccessible to such a large number of people? I think there are many different reasons. I'm just going to highlight a few. One of the main ones um, 
is that there is so much information around the graphic pipeline. This already starts from the application of your choice where you author 3D content, for example, Blender. You have to know what faces are, triangles are, UVs, normals, and all that. Then you input, uh, import those things in a game engine, and you kind of have to understand how these information are bundled together, uh, what are materials, um, what is texture streaming, and so on. On top of that, you need to understand how GPU and CPU communicate with each other, things such as draw call and state changes and batching. Once the information gets to the GPU, there is your vertex shader, fragment shader, tessellation, series of tests, caches, and so on and so forth. So this can be very overwhelming for a beginner who's just starting off in the field. And although you don't have to know everything when you're starting off, chances are for the technique you want to implement or understanding other people's shader work, you kind of have to have an overview of pretty much everything. At the same time, knowing these things is kind of like knowing your way around your kitchen. That doesn't make you a great cook. For that, you kind of need recipes, right? And this is where graphic techniques and literature around them comes into play. This is things like how do you do render, how do you uh, render smoke, how do you do water, what about ambient occlusion or stylized rendering. Again, this can be a lot of information for someone who's just starting off because there's just so much out there and so much that has already been tried. You don't have to know everything to start off, but there's a lot of common ground between these different graphic techniques, which you do need to master in order to make your own shaders or in order to understand the works of others. The last point is, in my, in my opinion, the main reason, like the biggest uh, blocker for people to get into shader development. Writing shaders is kind of a very specific type of multi-threading. Again, a type where you take the same instruction set and you apply it to a lot of data. Most people who are kind of working in Unity or Unreal are very, very used to object-oriented single-threaded programming. And there is, there is a lot of things that you just cannot do um, in a multi-threaded setting, which you can easily do in object-oriented programming. These are things like just writing to a global parameter that a state has changed in the thread. That means you have to completely rethink how to save stuff in memory, so how things are laid out in memory. You have to rethink how to synchronize between different steps of your application. Um, debugging and uh, performance optimization becomes very difficult because there are hundreds of threads and you never know why a specific thread is behaving in a specific way. I think the most challenging part though is adding variation because remember you are applying the same set of instruction but just because you're applying the same instructions doesn't mean you want the same output, right? For example, if you're processing this uh, pixels on the screen, you don't want everything to be red. You want an, a coherent image to come out where each pixel has a different color value. So you have to so somehow find a way to map this input to an output in a way where just because the input varies, the output comes out as a coherent image. It's actually pretty wild if you think about it that we do manage to render entire game worlds uh, using this method. So where do you get started, right? If uh, you don't want to be blocked by these things. So for the first part, the graphic pipeline knowledge, there are many different books. I personally suggest these two to start off. Practical rendering and computation with DirectX 11. Although this is a DirectX 11 specific book, the main part I'm suggesting you to read is the knowledge of how does a CPU, uh, GPU work what are resources, how does a resource um, contribute to a shader, and so on and so forth. And this knowledge is invaluable and you can easily carry it over to any game engine because game engines only write a wrapper around the core functionality. The other book I suggest is Game Engine Development, the rendering part, which um, like looks at the problem from a different angle. You kind of look at the problem from the perspective of the engine. How do you create a render loop? Um, in order to render a 3D scene on a 2D screen. And you learn about things like materials and how that works under the hood. For the graphic techniques, again, there are a bunch of different books. My favorite is Real-Time Rendering, which is a pretty massive book, but I still suggest you read it back to back. It's a collection of pretty much all the different areas of computer graphics covering blog posts and different papers. 
And um, it's a great book to get started with because it doesn't go into so much detail that it overwhelms you, but it does cover the, uh, the topics enough in enough depth for you to kind of realize the common grounds between different graphic technique and learn these tool sets for your own shader development. Last but not least, the number three is actually where I think people should start off with shader programming to kind of learn this mindset mentality of this multi-threading way of thinking. For that, I suggest the book of shaders, which again, I think that's where you should start with. The book is online, it's free and it's interactive. So you should give it a go, it's incredible. So the talk is about maths. How does mathematics help with any of these pain points? Because otherwise it would be pointless, right? So maths is great for learning graphic techniques because graphic techniques usually have their foundation in mathematics. And chances are, if you don't understand the maths you're using, not only can you not understand the technique themselves, you can't even use it because you cannot adjust the parameters to match the look you want to have. On top of that, mathematics also helps with this multi-threaded way of thinking. If you remember, I said you need to find a way to match an input to an output in a coherent way. And the way people do that is usually by stacking a bunch of mathematical formula on top of each other. I will show you an example of what that means to map an input to an output using mathematical formulas in a few slides. So what maths do you need in order to program shaders? This is based on my experiences. If you are, for example, in ray tracing, chances are you use also a lot of statistics, but these are just my personal experiences. The first type of maths you need is what I call simple, simple mathematics from high school. These are things like trigonometry, sinos, cosinos, vectors. What does it mean to add or subtract a vector? Um, geometry is just using the simple information to kind of calculate simple properties of 2D and 3D shapes. The second part is the shaping functions. If you remember from high school, you had this thing f of x in a bracket. If you added something within the bracket, you move the function to left and right outside, up and down, and you can stretch the function in either dimensions. It's hard to stress how incredibly important shaping functions are for um, shader development. Because we use mathematics to kind of map the input to the output, you can think of it like each math formula we use in a shader, like a Lego building block, right? We stack them on top of each other and we, we make a building, and the building is what we're interested in. If you know shaping functions well, you can kind of adjust the forms, the shapes, the colors of each individual uh, building block. And through that, it's directly related to your ability to realize the aesthetic vision you have in your mind for your visual effect. Last is linear algebra, which I will get to in a second. So first, let's give a practical example of how this mathematical way of programming could work. Let's say you want to have a pulsing object. The object goes between black and white. There are ways to do this in a single threaded uh, object oriented programming, which I'm not going to go into, involving timers and Booleans and all that. For this, uh, we are going to use a wave function. A wave function is a function where, as you go in one axis towards infinity, in the other axis, it goes back and forth between two values. For example, on the left side, we are using a sinus, and we are directly mapping the output of the sinus to the brightness of the object. Pretty simple. You can already see the use of shaping function here because the sinus itself goes between minus one and one, whereas we have to remap this function so that it goes between zero and one. So this is the, probably the simplest uh, use case of shaping, shaping functions you can find. On the right, there's a more complicated use of shaping functions where if you change the behavior of how uh, this wave function looks like, so how the animation feeds from something more organic to something more uh, mechanic by using something called the triangular waves, which is again, just created with simple shaping functions uh, methods. So before going into linear algebra, I would like to share with you an exercise I like to do. In the previous frame uh, slide, you might have noticed that a sinus kind of looks like a mountain. Using shaping functions, you can change the properties of sinus in a way where it's not just a mountain, but a cityscape or a forest clouds and bushes and a moon. So what I like to do is to write a fragment shader from time to time that uses nothing but mathematics and shading functions. So no texture, no other global input, just maths. 
I have laid down three of these uh, exercises for you on the screen from left to right, uh, left being the oldest font and right the, the newest font. And you can see how through doing these exercises, I'm getting continuously better at using shaping functions to create a specific visuals. This is kind of like doing push-ups. You develop muscles and then you can use these muscles for actual development, your practical projects to do great things and look at your project. So linear algebra, why is it so important? Linear algebra does a lot of different things for you. Um, I don't have time to go over all of them, so I'm just going to focus on one example. Linear algebra kind of enables you to manipulate spaces as you wish. A vector is a direction with a magnitude. And if you put three vectors together, you get a matrix. The matrix is not just any representation of three vectors. A matrix represents a space, a space spanned by the base vectors you have put into that matrix. For example, the simplest space you can create is the identity matrix or identity space. You can see in the image how the identity space looks like. It's just basically your forward, right, and up vector, color coded as, as blue, red, and green. The special thing about the matrix is that if you take a point in a space and you multiply it with a matrix, you make it so that the matrix adopts the property of the space uh, the point adopts the property of the space, space which that matrix creates. By extension, if you take an entire 3D model, which is made out of many different points, and you run that through the matrix, you make it so that the properties of that space are carried over on that 3D model. What do I mean by that? For example, imagine a space where everything is stretched in the x-axis, being the right axis in this case compared to the other two axes. If you apply that space transformation to a model, you would see that the model scales in the x-axis and gets stretched. You might know this as the actual transforms in your game engine. And transforms also do nothing but use these matrices. Scaling is, of course, not the only transformations you can do. You can rotate, you can translate, you can skew, you can project. Projected, uh, projection is probably one of the most important transformations we have out there for rendering, because it is the act of taking a 3D object and projecting it on a 2D surface, which is the basis of rendering when the 2D surface happens to be the canvas of the camera. I'm not going to go into much detail on how to construct these spaces mathematically. I do have two blog posts for that, matrices for tech artists, part one and two, which you can have a look and I'll go very slowly and explain these things. What I kind of want to do here is to get you excited about the idea that when you really master linear algebra, you can move anything however you want. You can deform anything however you want. You can do incredible effects by just manipulating the spaces like some sort of God. So let's do a very practical example now. I have actually used this uh, in my projects before. Um, imagine you have a character, right? Uh, the character has a head, the head has a pivot, and you want the character head to kind of follow and uh, follow an object that's flying around the 3D space. You can do this, of course, in a more traditional way, which I'm not going to cover. However, I'm going to cover another way using matrices, which is really fast and simple to do. The only way, the only thing you need to do is to construct a space with a single property. This space needs to have its forward vector aligned the vector that goes between the pivot of rotation of the head to the look at target you wish to follow. If you create this space and you run the mesh through it, you will see that the mesh would rotate around, around that pivot, and the nose of the character would always be aligned with this vector and would be always pointing towards this target you're supposed to follow. This is not exactly what you want, because you, want, you don't want the entire character to move. You just want the head and perhaps the shoulder to move. So you can now you need to construct two spaces, one where the character moves, another where the character doesn't, just st stays stand still and does nothing. We know from a few uh, slides ago, this is the identity space where the character doesn't move. So now you just simply blend between these two different spaces based on how uh, far away it is from the pivot. So that would look like this. The important thing to mention here is that making this took me around three minutes, and I'm not kidding. 
the main point is that the entire effect is done in three, four lines of code. And because it's done completely procedurally, I can easily adopt it to different type of uh, bodies with different sizes. On top of that, because it's done procedurally and mathematically and on the GPU, I can have hundreds of these, if not hundreds of thousands, without having frame drop. You can't say the same about inverse kinematic rigging. On top of that, you can kind of combine this method of procedural animation with more classical animation using rigging, weight painting, keyframes, and so on and so forth. In this example, for example, the cat's tail is moving, and also the ear and the slight body movement is keyframe, whereas the head follows the camera around using this procedural method. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail on how to do this. I do have a blog post out for it called Look at Transformation Matrices in Vertex Jada, which you can have a look if you want to. Um, the main point is to kind of, again, pitch to you the idea that by knowing linear algebra, you can kind of, you know, empower yourself to do whatever your mind sets to. Um, whatever you imagine, you can program. So let's say now you do want to learn linear algebra. Where do, where do you get started? How do you do that? Again, I'm going to pitch the way I did it because it really worked out well for me. Um, it might also work out well for you. One of the first things that people say when we talk about linear algebra is um, they mentioned a series of video introduction to linear algebra on YouTube from the channel Free Blue Ron Brown. And they ask if that's enough. Um, those videos are amazing. I have watched all of them. I've watched most of his videos, and I think you should too. However, there is a difference between understanding and knowing something. And if you truly want to understand something, you have to spend a considerable amount of time applying that knowledge within practical uh, examples. The other thing is people say, okay, so maybe I take a project that has a lot of maps in it, and I learn linear algebra through that. I love project-based learning because of many reasons. However, even in a very math heavy project, you are doing 20 to 30% mathematic. The rest is setting up environments, resource management, debugging, version control, and so on and so forth. So if you want to learn linear algebra only that way, you should do that anyway. But if you want to learn only within, within project based, it will take you forever. That's why I kind of suggest to learn the way I did it, which was buy a really good book, which is well thought through. And each exercise need, leads to an intuition and leads to the next exercise. And just go through it back to back and solve every single problem. I suggest the book Introduction to Linear Algebra from Strang, which also has an accompanying uh, video course from MIT. So yeah, that was it from me. Thank you for listening. I hope at least I got you a bit excited about the amazing things you can do uh, using linear algebra and mathematics and shaders. Uh, I'm here for any questions. I'm just going to leave you with a video of uh, the stuff I have done using linear algebra and matrices over the past few years. So let's look at the question. From where can I start learning about shaders? So the slides are going to be available afterwards, uh, which you can have a look into. Um, and that's going to be you know, the, the resources I mentioned, especially the book of shaders, is probably the best place to actually start looking at them. Is shaders, uh, are shaders heavy for mobile performance stuff? Yeah, shaders, uh, mobile has many different issues. One of them is usually the GPU and the CPU share the same memory and the same bandwidth. Um, that makes it very difficult to write shaders for mobile because there is a lot of bandwidth pressure. However, the game we are developing right now, Puzzling Places, is a uh, on Oculus Quest, which is a mobile platform. And interestingly enough, some shaders perform better in Oculus Quest than they do on PlayStation 4, for example. So I use uh, mobile shaders all the time. And using GPUs is one of the ways you can actually make good looking applications on mobile. Do you know any implementation of uh, Ren attack, I assume? What is that? That is practically faster than path tracing or rasterization. Uh, hmm. Now, top of my head, I wouldn't be able to answer that question well. Where can we find your blog? Um, yeah, just if you just Google my name, uh, you would easily be able to find it. But I can also post the link uh, in the in the discussion section. Um, yeah. Would you suggest using Shader Toy for learning shader programming? Absolutely. Um, the moment you go through uh, Book of Shaders, 
you do, I, I do suggest to go through Shader Toy and start learning uh, from other people, but also make your own things. I also have a Shader Toy page and I, I make things there regularly. As a matter of fact, the uh, landscape uh, exercise that I mentioned, I do all of those in Shader Toy. It's very convenient. You can even program it on your mobile phone. It's incredible. So linear algebra is good for graphic programming. I agree. <laughs> I don't know if that's a question, but I do agree. It's uh, incredible for graphic programming and also many other things, right? So a lot of things that um, we do for linear algebra in graphic programming easily carries itself over to computer vision or uh, machine learning, for example. What is a good starting point to actually code shaders in Unity, Unreal, or Shader Toy? Um, kind of depends because I, I always say a good way is a way where you actually spend time doing it, right? So different people work in different ways. And um, if you kind of start in Shader Toy, you start learning about this multi-threaded way of thinking, which is what I suggest because you do have to learn that before you do anything else. Uh, because you don't have to in Shader Toy worry about the rest of the graphic pipeline. You just have a fragment shader and you want to make an image with it. Um, However, you can't learn the entire pipeline that way, right? At some points, you have to switch to Unity or Unreal to start learning about the rest of the technique, which is how do you manage the resources around the technique and synchronize many different steps in order to, in order to create something. So I would say start with Shader Toy, and then at some point, uh, you would have to start Unity using Unity and Unreal, uh, which kind of abstracts away graphic API so that you can focus on the actual graphic techniques. If you want to go even further at some point, write your own game engine where you have to deal with OpenGL or if you're really adventurous, Vulkan. Um, so is it possible, like, uh, so I think I lost the question. Was the question. Okay, that one I answered. Is it possible to start learning what is needed for tech art using uh, nodes before transitioning to programming? And is it essential? Um, uh, you don't like programming is programming right like if uh, with nodes you can get the effects you want go for it that's incredible uh i'm not a fan of node based programming for shaders mainly because node base is kind of for when you write a lot of maths formula node base becomes like a spaghetti salad really fast it's visually really hard to understand what's going on um, but a lot of people work better in node base and i think whatever works for you you should start with that Game development is hard, learning shaders is hard. Do not create ar arbitrary boundaries uh, for yourself that it needs to be code. Uh, if you ever need to learn how to write, let's say HLSL or uh, other shading languages, you can easily adopt your knowledge from node base to them very fast. Um, so how would you explain homogeneous coordinate system in the simplest po possible way? Well, wow. um, I have a blog post about that. Uh, the simplest possible way would be uh, a good 10, 20 minutes. Um, I would say in the simplest way, it's kind of like a hack in graphic to encode translation, uh, like movement also uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in your matrices, because it technically movement is not an affine transformation because zero wouldn't remain in zero. And homogeneous coordinate system or a four in four matrix for, for graphics kind of help with that. Plus it also helps with projection and clipping and a bunch of different things. Um, what would be a good process tool to profile shaders performance on PC platforms? On PC platforms, where it depends kind of on your engine, like Unreal Insight uh, has really good tool sets. Um, and they do have a graphic section, if I remember. It was turned off on mobile like a few versions ago, but I think they have it now too. And Unity also has their profiling system where it kind of gives you a top-down um, view on how to profile your shaders. However, to know the specifics of what is costing you what in shaders is not an easy task at all. It's really hard to know what's the co co cause of the actual performance issues. Um, there is an entire section about this in real-time rendering, the book, which again, I suggest you to read. And um, there, there's like this type of diagram workflow where you're like, you have a guess that the problem is the bandwidth and then you reduce uh, screen resolution to kind of test your theory. And if it's not that, then you do a different test. So it's a very involved process. It's not, it's not easy at all. Um, so it's difficult to debug and check the logic in Shader. Can you suggest easy way to debug? Yeah, uh, hmm. 
the I have different tricks, of course. Uh, one of them is uh, to use time. So basically, for debugging, you need to kind of like come up with a visual way of doing it, right? For example, if you want to know if you mapped your space correctly between zero and one, the thing I like to do is uh, to run time and run it through a frac function so that it keeps going between zero and one. Then use a step function to kind of visualize areas that's below this uh, counting parameter um, as black and the rest as white. So basically, you have to come up with visual visual ways to debug these things. It's it's not easy. Um, that's one of the things you have to get used to when you start doing shader programming. Does shader programming help in draw call uh, optimization in any way? Um, well, shader programming, the writing of shader itself, it depends, yes. But uh, when I say shader programming, I mean more than just writing shaders, right? So I did talk about the graphic pipeline. And um, yeah, once you know what you're doing, once you understand what is like expensive regarding, for example, a common misconception is that draw calls themselves are the things that are very expensive. Whereas it's actually the state changes and the validation which the GPU uh, driver needs to do when the state changes. Um, so once you understand these things, it does help because you kind of know what you're doing and you can kind of optimize your render loop uh, for your, your own specific use case um, so that it runs faster. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why a company would hire someone like me because I could tell them, hey, you should stop like optimizing, I don't know, your sinus and cosinus in your C sharp. You should start worrying about, I don't know, changing texture 50 times in a, in a render loop or whatever. Um, is it possible to optimize graphics with linear algebra? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Like I already give you an example of how, the example with a pulsing object, you could also do it uh, using C sharp, right? You have a, a, a timer in C sharp, you count it up and you count it down. And uh, every time this number changes, you let GPU know, right? By setting the material, like a uniform float on a material. The issue with that is that every time you do that, uh, the communication between GPU and CPU is relatively expensive. Uh, and by doing it mathematically, you don't have to pay that cost. That was more like analytical way. Um, linear algebra does similar things, right? So instead of like complicated logic-based, state-based programming, you can simply break down a problem in a mathematical formula, then the states disappear, right? And because the inner states disappear, things become way more optimized. Uh, you have less instructions. You don't have to worry about things like missed caches or stuff. It's a, it's a long story, but yeah, it can help to optimize. Uh, for people interested in game design, where should be the starting point? Uh, make your own games. And for the love of God, do not make an MMORPG. Uh, I did study game design. And uh, one of the best things you learn from actually getting into game design is there's very little you can do on your own or even with a team of two and three. So start making your own games. That's the best way to learn. Uh, to learn even if you enjoy making games as a game designer. Um, but make the scope incredibly small. Uh, so let's see. For people say in games, OK, that's not answered. What is the best way uh, or course to learn tessellation and fluid mechanics? Uh, hmm. Very specific. For tessellation, it depends on the engine of your choice. If you want to understand kind of like the underlying thing of what the GPU does regarding tessellation, uh, you can read any of the graphic API books. Practical rendering uh, with DirectX 11, I think, has a section on tessellation. But I'm sure most of the other graphic books I mentioned have a section on tessellation. Um, for an engine of choice, unfortunately, it's usually very badly documented. That's one of the advantages of node-based programming is that it changes badly documented uh, macro code hidden somewhere to toolboxes and checkboxes in a, in a UI. Um, so with Unreal, for example, it's super easy. You just turn it on, and then you set a tessellation level. Uh, if you're programming your shader in, a, in an environment, in an in engine environment, you have to figure out how the engine wrapped uh, the code uh, around the base tessellation thing. Uh, for fluid mechanics and fluid dynamic stuff, uh, I do have a blog post about it, uh, actually, uh, where I kind of like not only break it down in an intuitive way, uh, using as little maths as possible, but I also suggest uh, further research papers and, and books you can, you can get into. 
So what is the minimum hardware requirement to use shaders? Uh, wow, it has been a long time since shaders have been uh, programmable. Like at the moment, you don't have to worry about shaders not being uh, by 99.9% .9 of the hardware out there, shaders are accessible and you can use them. Some things like compute shaders, uh, for example, in OpenGL, I think from OpenGL 3.2, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have it at the top of my head, but some stuff are new. And the newer graphic pipelines, uh, the, the graphic APIs, are kind of trying to eliminate or minimize the cost of draw calls and state changes. And the graphic industry kind of does move, so you do have to know what software you're on, uh, what hardware you're on. But for just shading, writing shaders, you're pretty much good. Like, um, where can I learn linear algebra for movement, like character object, movement space? I, I would suggest to just read that book, uh, Introduction to Linear Algebra. Like, uh, you can read my matrices blog post, and I do kind of try to give you at least a minimum amount of intuition without having to spend hundreds of hours learning linear algebra. But um, you do have to just spend a lot of time solving and actual exercises in order to understand how to how to use matrices to move things. Uh, you can get away with simple vector stuff and physics simulation, by the way, uh, like a physics engine, if you want to. Uh, you don't have to use linear algebra. What are some resources I can look at to learn more about compute shaders for not strictly graphic users? Well, that's a difficult one. Um, that's a difficult one, especially if you're within Unity or Unreal, because uh, so the, the science community has been using GPUs for uh, processing and, and simulation stuff since forever, since before compute shaders, using fragment shaders and stuff. And they're really, really good at it. They're really fit in it. Uh, and compute shaders, a lot of people who kind of like use them have external knowledge about graphic API, also people who use them within an Unity or Unreal. And that's why Unity or Unreal uh, do not document the use of uh, compute shaders all that much because the very small subsection of people who are using them already kind of know how they work from outside. I really recommend the practical rendering book. I, I suggested the DirectX 11 because the most confusing thing about computer shaders is understanding how resources work and how threads and, and wave fronts like map with each other, the caches and group shared memory and all these things. And that book does a brilliant job of, of covering those things. Uh, and what, when you learn that for, for graphic or non-graphic, it's all the same, right? You just master it and it's done. Uh, is linear algebra good for calculate physics and do simulations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, at, on the screen right now, you're seeing a fluid simulation. A very important part of the fluid simulation is the projection, where you try to take a, a velocity field that has a divergence, and you try to project it in its base, vector basis so that you separate in a divergent-free and with divergence. So a very simple example of uh, fluid simulation was there, but yeah, for sure, uh, it's, it's necessary. And um, also the other thing is solvers, right? Solvers are pure linear algebra. Those are like, uh, okay, they're not pure. We can also approach them from different uh, angles, but uh, things like Jacobi solvers and uh, gauss seidel they have a matrix representation. Um, is full stack game developer a thing in the industry? Uh, I'd, I don't know what full stack in this context would mean specifically. Depends on where you want to work. If you want to work in a smaller company, Chances are you do everything from coming up with a concept, programming it, uh, developing looks for it, maybe even making sound for it, writing <laughs> marketing materials for it, if you're in a very small company. Um, the bigger the company gets, uh, the more people specialize at very specific things. To a point, if you're in a very large company, uh, you would do that one thing and nothing else, right? So depending on where you want to work, um, you know, it, it's a thing, yeah. What kind of portfolio is needed for rendering engineering? Um, well, usually like one of the things that you would need to know is showcase them that you can use graphic APIs um, if you are going to work in a native engine, right? Um, if you're gonna work with like Unity or Unreal, that's all right. You don't have to be uh, showing that you're really fit with graphic APIs. But if you do wanna go and work for DICE or EA or, or even for Unity engine itself, then you need to showcase you can't use graphic APIs. And you kind of know the pain points of uh, engine development regarding those things like 
I don't know, uh, multi-platform and how do you wrap your code so that it works on multi multiple uh, graphic APIs and so on and so forth. Um, on top of that though, you do need to showcase also graphic techniques, like no knowledge of actual graphic techniques. One way people usually do stuff like this is then they kind of like create a native application using graphic API, uh, and they do a very specific graphic techniques, such as ocean rendering. They take like a popular paper and then they just do an implementation of that paper. And that kind of showcases uh, that you can do both. And um, that should be enough. However, I do suggest to contact a senior graphic renderer or engineer on Twitter. They're all on Twitter, almost everyone um, of the company you want to work for and ask them beforehand. Uh, and they're very helpful and very kind. And they will let you know what, what makes sense uh, for, your, for your application. Um, so let's say, is linear algebra used in software development? Absolutely. Uh, again, for example, computer vision. Computer vision, uh, doing things like uh, SIFT algorithm, uh, stuff like that, yeah, scale independent stuff. Um, let's see, machine learning. So matrices are a foundation of a lot of things and so are spaces. Uh, compression. Right, Fourier transforms, signal processing, like matrices are everywhere uh, because they are a very compact way of representing numbers and information. And uh, you can kind of do things, for example, face detection. Like I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, linear algebra is truly everywhere. Um, in my own professional career, I have seen, I've used way more linear algebra than I have used calculus, for example. I usually only use calculus to understand a certain graphic uh, technique or paper. Whereas linear algebra is uh, is my daily use uh, for everything. Yep. Um, if there are no questions, I suppose I can just copy paste the medium link. As I said, it would be here, and you can just um, the stuff I mentioned, and also the link for the uh, blog. I would also then simply put here. Uh, for the for the slides and uh yep that would be it hey thank you Sharia, so much for this i hope the audience have learned a lot of stuff i think we already answered pretty much all the questions and i have i hope they have solved their doubts that whatever they have in their minds so guys we have one more minute if there is any other question you can drop that in Copy this link. So here's the link to the slides. Uh, it's available and it's going to be available for a while. So I will keep it online for a year okay. or so. Okay. Thank you for that, Chair. Uh, guys, this session is ending. Uh, the next session will, is on Verlet Physics, Simple but Effective Method for Physics Simulation in Games by Alan Wolf. It's starting in some time, in a couple of minutes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jariyar. Uh, should I answer the question that popped up, or uh, are they talked on? Yeah, you can answer. Yeah. Okay. How to integrate part, uh, integ to do integration part in code G C G and just <clears throat> integration? You mean like integrals, or uh, I'm I'm confused by the question. Uh, could you please tell how shaders are used in your clips where portraits are being made? The entire thing done in compute shaders. Um, there's almost, besides managing resources, there's almost zero CPU involvement. And uh, that is a case of, uh, classic case of gradient descent, where uh, the algorithm tries to improve itself or improve the work it's doing uh, by, by a fitness function. And the entire setup is done in the GPU. Um, and also the fitness function and the evaluation is also done in, in the GPU. How can I convert linear algebra to a code for my project? Uh, well, if you just look at a simple vertex shader, for example, you already see linear algebra, right? Um, vertex shaders have this object to world and world to clip space things. So that's the simplest way where you can see where how linear algebra is being used. Uh, but matrices, uh, as far as matrices are concerned, again, you kind of, the trick is to learn how to construct spaces with certain properties, and then you manipulate objects 
using those properties. And I gave an example of 3D meshes. However, this also applies to signal processing, to audio, to uh, other information, uh, such as data information about uh, how people move and whatnot. Um, in the formula, okay. Again, I, I really, uh, really use those, but if you think about it, the uh, rendering algorithm is actually one giant integral. Uh, so that's probably like the, the most common use cases of it. But coming up with these formulas is usually the job of the academic section of graphic programmers. Uh, they spend years working on specific things to come up with formulations that are very optimized uh, and doable. So I suppose that's it. Then I wish you guys okay. a lot of luck. And your next speaker is a brilliant man. Uh, probably going to join too. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this.